All right, guys, welcome. And uh, I have a good news for you. This is the last session. <laughs> so welcome to my presentation on architecture for scaling Java applications to multiple servers. In case you're wondering, originally I'm from Russia, so that's where the accent from. My name is Slava, I'm a founder and a software engineer at Kashonic Systems. So uh, back when I was a boy, uh, me and my family lived uh, in a city which is called Baikonur, and it's, which is a city that's a home to uh, engineers that serve uh, Russia's main space launch pad. And at the entrance to the city, we have this uh, structure, a monument, and it's supposed to be an astronaut uh, welcoming uh, visitors with wide open hands, and we're welcoming them to the city. We call this guy the fisherman, because it shows how big of a fish he caught. <laughs> so to start, let's look how the normal, our typical uh, application looks like on a single server. We have users hitting uh, the application through uh, the network. We have the application, we have a, maybe we have a local front cache to cache uh, the data produced by business logic. We have business tier that uses uh, hash maps and uh, concurrency logs. We have a data tier uh, with ORM framework and usually a local level two cache. And this all goes to a single source of truth such as database, Hadoop clusters, file system, whatnot. But sooner or later, what happens is that you, you will exhaust the resources of your single server, right? And uh, you don't have any choice, but you have to scale, you have to scale to multiple servers, uh, or it's also known as scaling horizontally. You can scale inside your local data center uh, using your local area network, or you can scale uh, in Amazon cloud, it doesn't really matter. But it's gonna happen, resources are limited. That's basically give you an idea. You go from the, uh, your standard architecture into the clustered one. And when you do this, it's actually not that easy because uh, distributed applications have to deal with a lot of stuff that you don't see in the applications that sit inside a local JVM or inside a single JVM. Right? And things you have to take care of is horizontal scalability, reliability, concurrency, state sharing, data consistency, load balancing, failure management, and you also want to make sure that it is as easy to develop as if you were developing inside a single JVM. Right? You don't usually deal with this stuff inside when you are developing a single server application. And to define horizontal scalability essentially is a ability to handle additional load by adding more servers. It's different from vertical scalability because vertical scalability is when you try to handle more load by adding more resources into a single server, such as faster CPU, more memory, uh, faster network cards, using SSDs versus uh, hard drives. Right? And horizontal scalability gives you uh, much better benefit uh, when you add more servers because in order to scale, you just keep adding servers. And if you take a single server, you can go that far. Well, right now, I mean, if you, if you look at the hardware available, you can have a uh, 32 cores, 120 gig, one, what, 128 gig RAM server, that's it, right? What if you need 500 CPUs? What if you need a terabyte of heap. And that's where the horizontal scalability helps. But it's not that easy because usually a horizontal scalability hard to achieve because it hits bottlenecks and it pretty much happens all the time. Uh, and usually those bottlenecks are shared resources that require sequential access. And this usually includes databases, again, Hadoop clusters, 
file systems, mainframes, external web services, right? And it's not that databases are bad because databases are important now and they're gonna stay important because they provide you single source of truth and they, they make sure that all your requests are transactional and properly stored and available for you for later retrieval. But the result of it is that you, they process requests consequently and uh, that becomes a problem when you begin to add application servers. And databases and are notorious for being hard to scale uh, horizontally, at least within the ACID requirements. And to give you an example of a bottleneck free system, you have a, an application server that is capable of processing 5,000 requests per second. You have a database that can process 10,000 requests per second. And users basically pulling application server speed, right? There's no any problem here, right? It all goes straight through. This is a different example. So business grows and now you have to process 15,000 requests per second, per second. The nature of the decision is to add more application servers, right? And you add a couple more. You expect that you're gonna be, you're gonna be able to process 15,000 but it's not gonna happen because even though each of the application servers can give you 5,000, right, and in summary 15,000, the database is still can give you only 10,000, right? The demand is 15,000, capacity is 10,000. So you, you expect it to triple your capacity, but you only doubled it, right? You, you have a bottleneck. And the solution to this uh, problem is using uh, what's known as uh, distributed caching. And distributed cache essentially is a large uh, in-memory data store that stores all the frequently read information. And in case of distributed caching, you can have uh, caches which si those sizes exceed s your typical JVM tens times, 100 times. You can have a distributed cache that, which has a size of a, a, a terabyte if you want. And the, right now, the state of art is that you can cache everything. Any, po any possible combination, just if you, if you just have enough uh, servers in the cluster, you can, you can cache it all. It's, it's not that you have to do it, but yeah. And the application benefits because instead of going to the database, it now goes to the in-memory cache and just reads from memory instead of being stuck in the database. So back when I was living in that city, uh, this is how my backyard looked like. So it's really kind of hard to see, but this is my window, right? And this is what I had in my backyard. It's, it, what it's, it's called a technological model. Essentially, it's a full-blown rocket. It, and it's rocket in all parts except one. It cannot fly. And those models are used to test ground systems. So they, they test if you can drive it, if you can put it into the starting position and everything. So that's what I had. This is the view from my window. That was the view. And distributed caching, uh, distributed caches in, compared to your simple uh, local JVM caches have distinct requirements. One is uh, data consistency, and it means that when someone puts put something into the cache, all servers in the cluster should observe it. Right? There's this notion of eventual consistency, which is another word for inconsistent. If you put something in the cache and you don't see it for two hours, it's not consistency, it's inconsistency. Load balancing. And in case of load balancing, you want to make sure that once new servers join the cluster, the data is automatically moved to that server so that each of the servers carries a fair share of load. And high availability. Servers, networks break, uh, servers die, and your system has to continue to operate. And you don't want to see the situations when a server joined and for extended period of time, or for any period of time, uh, application sitting on that server doesn't see the cache data from the other servers. 
So that's important. And the capabilities that your typical distributed caching system have to have in order for a system to work properly is cache coherency, partitioning, and replication. The next problem your distributed applications have to deal with is, is reliability. And reliability is an ability of the system to continue to operate in presence of failures. Even th though servers fail or join the cluster, you, your system has, has to continue to operate without any hiccups, delays, or any other problems. And it's really hard because of the cluster reconfiguration. The solution to reliability in the case of distributed applications is replicate web sessions. And it works this way. If you have a web session, it's automatically replicated to all servers. All it's replicated in the cluster so that it's available to any server that wants to access it. Right? And even if the cluster node dies, uh, load balancer will automatically start feeding the data through working nodes. Right? Those working nodes will have access to the user's data. So you will see that even if the server is dead, user won't notice it, right? Because the session data is automatically, uh, synchronously, and reliably stored in the cluster. Another problem that uh, is kind of really hard to deal with is uh, a distributed con con concurrency. In your local environment, all you have to do to synchronize on shared resources is use either synchronize, uh, synchronization, which is built into the language, using synchronized keyword, right? Or you can use a concurrent package, which provides you uh, read-write logs. It's, I mean, it's really easy. You, this, is, this is as easy as it gets. So you have your uh, re-entrant read-write log from concurrent package, right? And uh, this is an example of uh, using those logs to access uh, a shared map. We have our map. For, pool, for write operations, we have write logs. And for read operations, we use read logs. It's fairly easy. But it's a problem, because in the distributed environment, you cannot use your shared memory to establish those mutual exclusions, because there's no shared memory. Right? Your servers are separated by the unreliable network. And again, uh, there's a problem. Imagine that one server on, or one JVM holds a log, and then it dies. It dies instantaneously, and you can kill something instantaneously just by pulling the network plug out, right? or just pressing the reset button. What happens to the other clusters, other members of the cluster? Are they going to ever get their log? The solution to this is uh, distributed read-write logs. And for this to work, uh, there are several important capabilities that uh, distributed read-write logs should provide. You have to have fault tolerance. They should be reliable, and they should be strictly consistent. Fault tolerance in our case means that even even the server dies, that it, in the dies when holding a log, it should, the system should automatically release those logs, and other servers in the cluster should be able to acquire logs and continue uh, doing their business. Without it, the system is going to block, and you, you you have to restart the whole cluster. Right. Again, uh, even if the configuration changes. Uh, to any local JVM, your distributed logs should look like your local logs. This, the system sh should not know that it's dealing with the distributed application, right? Because the, pretty much this is the goal of the distributed, in, uh, distributed architecture, to be able to code, to write your software without caring that there is a network, network is unreliable, slow, can break, servers can die and everything. But there are certain, there's basically a price for this, and, uh, but we'll talk about it later. Speaking of consistency, when you talk about different layers, for example, the data consistency means 
slightly different things when you talk about uh, distributed concurrency. In case of the distributed concurrency, strict consistency means that uh, even if the cluster is reconfiguring and, for example, a new node joins, right, this node should be aware that there are already logs and when it tries to acquire those logs locally, it should wait until those logs release in the cluster. Another problem is uh, distributed shared state. For threads to do useful work, they have to access shared resources at, at some point. It can be uh, name data, it can be uh, queues, anything. Threads have to have access to shared resources, right? And in case of local JVMs, it's really trivial. Because again, we, we saw this example before, but in our case, if you wanna have a, for example, we have a map that contains usernames, for example, or passwords, right? That are stored and accessible to all threads in the system. Uh, all you have to do is to, you put your keys and values to the map and you are done, right? Well, of course, using proper synchronization or locking, but it's, it takes what, like, roughly 40 lines of code, and it's trivial. Again, it's not that easy when you are inside the cluster, because your map is not on the network, right? It is, it is local, and how do, how do you do it so that you can access that map uh, over the network? The solution is a distributed hash map. And the distributed hash map must have these capabilities. It should be reliable and strictly consistent. Reliability means that after you put data in, the, in, the, in this map, even if other nodes die or new nodes join, it's, the data should be available to all uh, members of the cluster. And all members of the cluster should see this data consistently and coherently. And that, th this is true for updates. So basically when I lived in that city, uh, we had uh, our fair share of night launches. And this is how our typical night launch looked like. Which is basically a dark sky. And that's because the launch pad was about uh, like 40 miles away from the city. You cannot really see anything during the night, right? And, but once in a while, we would get something like that. Uh, and that's a shot from a, from a balcony. It's hard to see, but this is like a five-story building. Right? This is a horizon. And, and what you see here is a, uh, maybe uh, 30, 30 seconds into launch. Right? This is a, where beyond the horizon it started, and then it flew up and away. And this structure is basically the trails of the first stage, the trails of the engines that are working in the first stage. And they're lit up by the sun from under the horizon. And that's where you're, this is where the rocket is flying. Failure management. It's, it's impossible to develop a distributed application that is not exposed to failures because, as we mentioned, uh, the concerns that applications have to deal with are not present in local applications. Networks fails, uh, network, networks fail, uh, servers fail, uh, latency changes, uh, topology changes, and it all sooner or later leads in the situations well, the requirements that are presented by your software towards APIs that support develop, uh, distributed development are going to be violated. It means that uh, strictly consistent operations are going to fail. 
And there are a few cases when it's going to happen. One, one of the case, cases is, imagine you have a cluster and it's made of 50 nodes, right? And then some switch fails and then the cluster breaks into one consisting of 40 nodes and one consisting of 10 nodes. You have a situation what's called minority-majority cluster, right? Because one of the clusters is bigger than, than the other, other one, but they still are accessible to the user. Uh, if they continue to operate like nothing happened, there's a situation when they will be dealing with inconsistent data views. For example, one user updates uh, cache inside a small cluster, and the other user updates a cache inside, inside majority cluster. What happens? Right? They will be observing different data. This is unacceptable for mission critical applications. And this is happening. The, 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 the only real solution to this problem, which doesn't violate consistency requirements, is to block the minority cluster until, until it becomes majority cluster or until it joins the majority cluster because uh, the network infrastructure got repaired. But if you are a user, would you appreciate if you click on a button, go to Amazon, for example, and wait for two minutes, right, before getting a response? It's not good. Another problem is that when the server inside the minority cluster, and it's a minor operational minority cluster, but then the system repairs and it has to leave the minority cluster and join the majority cluster to provide the consistent results, right? Any, any consistent operations that was in progress, for example, uh, uh, place distributed logs, uh, 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 working or waiting for responses when you uh, execute put or get inside uh, a distributed hash map, or if the systems try to read or write from the uh, replicated session storage, what should happen? Well, those operations must be canceled. And in, in Java, in, if you use standard uh, concurrent, uh, concurrent package API, if you place a lock, and if you say unlock, right, nothing ever is going to happen because uh, you own the lock, you, you unlock it, then it's available to everyone else. But in this situation, those operations may and have to throw exceptions because whatever you were doing before that is no longer valid. And your assumptions that you released the log or if you acquired the log, right, and you, you, whatever you were doing was valid is no longer valid because the node is no longer belongs to the cluster. So to manage those fa failures, the application must be able to receive a report about cluster state. And the normal, I think it's a kind of sort of a pattern. If the cluster blocks because it has become a minority cluster, your application must receive a synchronous call saying, hey, we are no, no longer operational. And that gives you a chance to display to the user some sort of a graceful notice saying that our system is undergoing reconfiguration. We appreciate you waiting. Please come back in 30 seconds or two minutes. Because uh, these days, I think, if you, if you click on, some, on a link and it doesn't respond within 10 seconds, you consider the system broken. It used to be, I think, 30 seconds. Now, maybe it's now it's even five, <laughs> especially if you use some big systems. Same true for uh, consistent operations. If reconfiguration does happen, the system must uh, break uh, and cancel operations that were in progress or the system was blocked on. When you write this uh, distributed application that uses uh, transparent concurrency primitives or transparent uh, and distributed uh, hash maps, you no longer can expect that if you call put or get into a map, you will get the response back because it might break. Usually in a normal situation, uh, it won't happen, but it will happen eventually. 
and the, the system must be prepared. This is basically, in a normal, uh, well-developed system, this is the only price you're going to pay. You don't have to code complex queuing mechanisms, cluster management, and anything. You just uh, make a call, obtain a reference to a hash map, and just use it. Or get an get a, get a instance of a log and use it. But it, it might break. For this to work, the system must have um, a cluster management and data distribution protocol. And uh, usually it's a wire level protocol that enables all those nice things that we talked about. Session replication, distributed caching, reliable distributed logs, state sharing, cluster management. So we started with a small picture of your typical local JVM architecture, and this is how your uh, distributed architecture looks like. We have web application. This load balancer, uh, it's, it, it must be present. How you do it depends. Uh, it can be uh, hardware load balancers such as um, Cisco's or F big, big Five, right? It can be Apache's, Apache has built in uh, modules for load balancing. But anyway, we have our application, we have our replicated sessions, we have our distributed front cache, we have our business logic talking to distributed hash map and using uh, distributed logs for state sharing and uh, distributed concurrency. We have our distributed level two cache and we have uh, cluster management and data, uh, and data distribution protocol. And this is basically, a, as we mentioned, it's a wire level network protocol. And it, it, we, I, I gave an example of two servers working, but it, it can be expanded to any number of servers. Well, uh, to develop such uh, Architecture to implement it uh, takes, uh, it will take anyone, even the smart guys, notice, notice, noticeable amount of time. And the good news is that uh, this effort has already been made. As it take like, three years to uh, work out the bugs, so it's, a, it's an effort. Those tools usually go under a common name which is known as Enterprise Data Grid. And the Enterprise Data Grid provides <coughs> cluster management and data distribution protocol that works over a reliable network plus a set of transparent APIs that support uh, reliable distributed caching, session replication, strictly cons consistent data access, distributed logs, and uh, cluster management. What you have to expect from such API is that it's easy to use. It does not require you to learn any networking programming or anything else. It just usually you would expect that these are transparent uh, primitive implementations of uh, primitives found in Java, implementations of uh, logs, maps, session, ma uh, session replication should be invisible. There are several implementations of such uh, enterprise da data grids. There are commercial ones which are uh, pretty high quality. There are also a couple of open source ones and uh, those are often don't provide all the capabilities you need and uh, usually sacrifice consistency and offer you so-called Eventual consistency. So back in those days, uh, when I was in tenth grade, uh, we were taken into a f to a field trip to the launch pad, uh, one of the launch pads. They're actually like thirty or something, but uh, we were taking one that uh, launches satellites. And uh, in the early morning, we were basically uh, woken up by sounds of sirens and we were running to uh, 
the desert about 700 yards away from it. And we sat on a small hill, and that's how the launch looked like from that distance. It was pretty cool, actually. Uh, and I would say that it's one of the most profound experiences I had. Because I think the, most pro the only more, more profound experience I ever had was a Pink Floyd concert. And even from that distance, when we were standing on that hill, when you see launches on TV, they, don't, they give you maybe 5% of what actually is going on. Because on that distance, your whole body vibrates on, on very low frequencies, plus it's, it's a basically a full spectrum from really low frequencies that you cannot even feel, but f feel only vibration to really high pitch noises. And it's just deafening, definitely loud. And it's, it's, it's very intense. So in uh, about 30 seconds, the rocket looks like this. Well, that's it about uh, architecture. The good news, it's possible. It's really easy to do if you choose the right tools. And next time you think about it, go for it. Now we are going to talk about best practices for about, uh, I hope, for another five minutes. And uh, then I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions. Well, first, best practice. Don't do it. Don't go deceive it. First of all, uh, most of the times when people decide to go distributed, they didn't ex use existing capacities of a single server applications. Uh, you can always, if your, if your servers were sitting in co-location for uh, two years, you can double or triple its performance just by replacing the server. You can have faster CPUs, faster memory, more memory, uh, faster hard drives, faster networks. And it costs almost nothing. Like you can get a good server for three, five thousand dollars, a really good one. Or if you are on a budget, you can buy a pretty good server for a thousand dollars off eBay. It's really easy to scale vertically. And uh, distributed development is a different story. First of all, distributed applications slower because they have to use network I.O. and they have to spend CPU cycles on maintaining clusters, maintaining uh, data consistency. Th they're going to be slower. The good news is that you, as you keep adding servers, your capacity is going to increase linearly if you use uh, uh, proper tools. Also, distributed systems require configuration, and it also uh, takes your time. It's, it's and there's no such thing as free, basically. If it takes time, it's, it's essentially time is the only thing you cannot buy. Right? If you spend a month doing something that you could do in two days by paying 500 bucks, well, this is the price of your time. Yes, and especially if you test, for example, if, if you write a unit test for a local application, it's trivial. If you write a unit test for clustered application, you have to start cluster nodes. If you if you're really serious about it, if you want to do functional testing, you have a you have to have a lab in your QA environment, or maybe even on Amazon Cloud. And this lab should be running your cluster. Uh, you should be able to deploy same versions of the applications. And it's it becomes pretty cumbersome. So if if you can stay local, stay in a single server. Another thing that you want to look when you're, when you're trying to stay local is to try to optimize. Uh, if your application has never been optimized, from my experience as a software engineer, well, it's a blanket statement. I would say that five, five times improvement in, in uh, capacity or uh, performance dash response time is easy if it's never was, was run under a profiler. Right? Invest into a, uh, into a good profiler. We use J profiler and it works really well. Uh, you have to have, even if you are doing distributed development, you have to have uh, load tests. Without load tests, if you just click a couple of times and see what's going on, you won't get a good picture. You can develop synthetic load tests, which hit a single point, or you can have 
there are tools uh, that give you an ability to write a lifelike tests that hit the application just the same way a normal user would do and hit the critical paths. And the anti-pattern is really the, 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 on, the only one, one, the big one, and we call it catch them all. It starts like this. Hmm, I looked in my profiler and it looks like most time is spent in allocating memory and string buffers. Why don't I cache string buffers? Well, here's the thing. Uh, caching can be expensive. It makes sense when the cost of caching is less than the cost of acquiring the object. Memory allocation in, in Java is, is, is almost free. If you compare costs of maintaining caches, and especially in the distributed environment, because in the distributed environment, your, hash, your cache can go to network and will go to network. Main, to maintain co uh, coherency, to maintain load balancing, to partition the data and everything. So it can be expensive. So cache only objects that are hard to get. Those are really coming from the databases, coming from uh, external data sources such as mainframes or external web services. Or if you have a Hadoop cluster, Hadoop jobs can take from tens of seconds to minutes and even hours. Now imagine that you issue the same request to Hadoop twice, right? And you, you crunch through five terabytes of data, spend 30 minutes in the cluster, got the result back. Do you want to do the same thing again next time? Right? And the results usually are much smaller than the data set you are processing. So it makes sense to cache only the data that is hard to get. One thing I didn't mention that, especially when it comes to front caching, uh, as opposed to level two, which is maintained by the framework, if you, when, when you begin to cache, you have to keep in mind that when there are updates to, this, uh, to, the, to the data, you have to invalidate those caches appropriately. So the design becomes more complex. So if you cache, cache right things, and possibly develop a thin layer that is responsible for doing it. There's also, uh, not, not all products have it, but uh, some products uh, provide you this ability uh, to have a cache read the data. Not you read, read the data and then you put it to the cache, but rather you ask cache for the data, cache checks if the data is not present, then get it from the data source. It's kind of, you know that, hey, if I want a list of my employees, I just go to the cache and it, I'll get it. Objects that are right mostly, they don't make sense to be, for, for, for caching because you spend time caching, but before you read it, it's, it's gonna be updated a thousand times, so you just spend time caching, not, not getting any benefits from, from the cache. Classical example, I think, I mean, these days, uh, big data is big, right? <laughs> and You get, for example, uh, lots of data that is coming from instruments, for example, right? For example, energy readings. Do you want to cache them? No. Because they're going to be stored, they're, you're going to be receiving them once every second. They're going to be stored, retrieved maybe once every year, and that's it. And as, as I mentioned, never cache memory locations. In the, in the profiler, especially when you're not running in the mode, uh, when you're running in the instrumented mode, Instrumentation can take a lot of time, and your memory allocations may look like, hey, this is the most expensive part of the system that I create object. This is not true. Uh, creating objects is almost free in Java, and deallocating them. It doesn't make that you have to sparingly create and drop them, but it does, it does make sense. My experience comes from back in, uh, I think, 2003, we were using XSL by IBM, it's called Zalen, I think, right? And they created a string buffer pool where you basically check out the buffer, right? String buffer, clear it, use it, check it in back. But the thing is that in order to check it out, you have to clear it. And that essentially means that every time you check it out from the pool, 
you allocate new memory. So essentially you do the same thing you would do normally if you just created the string buffer, but rather also spend time in synchronization in the string buffer pool. Never cache memory allocation. So as I mentioned, best candidates for caching, results of database queries, results of heavy I.O., XML, trans results of XML transformations and XML XSL transformations. Cache objects that I read mostly. Another best practice is infrastructure one, and uh, usually your infrastructure, if you do use data grids, if you do go distributed, you would have application traffic that comes through fire from the users through firewall and the load balancer, right? But you also have, are going to have traffic that, is, that serves the data grid, uh, cache coherency traffic, uh, partitioning, uh, log management, cluster management. This traffic has nothing to do with uh, what your users and your application wants, right? It doesn't really have to be there. So in the best uh, part is to take that traffic into the back end. Usually most of the servers you, you currently, if I'm talking about servers that you are running, most of the servers are coming with two network uh, connections. So you can use one connection to uh, serve the application traffic and then you can plug your uh, backend traffic into a separate switch and separate them. And this benefits actually both because they don't compete for the limited network bandwidth. So the last best practice we wanted to share is we wanted to suggest you to use uh, existing solutions. I must say that when we started developing uh, uh, Cashionix, and we continued, it, it's really fun because distributed computing and coding this stuff to make sure it works reliably and unreliable network, it's really fun for the engineer. It's, I'm, I'm still enjoying it. But it takes, if you want to do it right, two or three years to get it right. right? So I think what's your plan for the next three years? Uh, serve your users or um, develop something fun but it's going to take quite some time. Well, uh, I think we have arrived to our, the end of our session. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, guys, uh, if you need uh, slides from this presentation, uh, you can shoot me an email or uh, if, you, if you cannot read it from the presentation, you can stop by, get my business card, and I'll be happy to share those slides with you. Thank you.